present to you Dr. Kenneth Stevenson. Thank you for that. Um, a couple of years ago, a friend of mine said to me after reading several of my books, Ken, you need to write a white paper on the trout. And in typical fashion, I said, what's a white paper? And uh, he told me in no uncertain terms. So when I was asked to present uh, something for this conference, uh, without even thinking about it, I told Joe, I'm going to do a white paper. And after I looked at it and researched it and studied it, I didn't know which, which was worse, the hubris to think that I could write a white paper or that I could squeeze 32 years into 30 minutes. I don't know which is more difficult. Um, but actually, Rex did a great job last night of trying to do a white paper. If you look and listen to what he said, because he was able to, I don't know how he got so much information into that presentation. If you weren't here for it, get it. Because he said all the things I would have liked to try to squeeze into 30 minutes. And because there, uh, I think it was a wise man who said, uh, too much coincidence is no coincidence. Everybody that's getting up here is stepping on things I wanted to say. Thank you, Pete. You said a lot of things I wanted to say. Um, I went last night. Yeah, I do have a new grandchild, and uh, Mary was supposed to travel with me, but she went to be with Gigi. Um, Gigi is our firstborn, and in the beautiful pictures that I put up last night, she was the lovely little girl with my wife and two sons. And they all thought that Angela was um, conceived in Turin, but it ain't so. Uh, <laughs> Angela was born and was with us the next time we gathered together. And um, anyway, Gigi just gave us a beautiful baby girl. Um, he, God is in everything, I'm going to tell you. Uh, the doctor said she was going to be a problem. The doctor said she was going to have a problem because of her age. We said it ain't going to be so. And um, she's a beautiful, beautiful baby girl, mother and daughter are going fine, but Mary went to be with them. So having said that, let me try to get started. I really wanted to bring to your mind the idea that we need to have a totally new paradigm, a totally new concept where shroud studies are, are concerned. And I think there's a reason for that. The Lodge was right. An issue has been needlessly made to make the shroud religious. Notice I didn't say Christian, I didn't say Jewish, I said religious. As a spokesman and recording secretary, I was told clearly, you don't have the luxury of a personal opinion because you're speaking for us. And I said, fine. Did I not marry? Barry's a witness. I said, fine. When we were done with our research, all bets were off, and my personal opinion came out. Some people didn't like that. Ken Weaver refused to put my name in National Geographic because he said, you're a Christian and can't possibly be objective. Question, what makes an agnostic or an atheist any more objective about their religion than a Christian? Josh McDowell used to be one of my favorite apologists. Heard about my research, called to get an interview with me, interrogated me for three hours and said, you're emotionally involved in this thing. You can't possibly be objective. My own supervisor in the Air Force, it's the reason I got out, by the way, said, drop the shroud and I'll give you the rating you've earned. And I said to him, you already own my life 24-7. You're not going to control my spiritual destiny. The rest, as they say, is history. But how do I put 32 years of a magnificent obsession into 30 minutes? I'm not sure it can be done. How do I get all of these different fields of expertise and, and you know, Pete, you were right, that whole technical thing. I've got engineering degree. I took all kinds of engineering courses at the academy. It'll put you to sleep. It really will. But the fact of the matter is, at the end of the day, we've got to take all that technical jargon and we've got to translate it so that people can read it and reach some kind of an understanding of what this thing we call the Shroud is really all about. We sat in, um, it wasn't Amsterdam, where was the final uh, conference? New London. New London. We sat in New London, 
And reporter after reporter after reporter said, I know that you don't want to say this, but what is your personal opinion? You never heard so many PhDs going humana, 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 humana in your life. <laughs> These were the same guys that I carpooled with, that we broke bread together, that we prayed together, that I could tell you all kinds of vignettes and stories and could and D could. We could all share with you things that happened that we know were the hand of God. And when they were faced with making a personal comment, do you think it's Jesus? They lost their mind. I love them. Don't get me wrong. But maybe it's because going to the Air Force Academy to begin with, they used to have something called the whole man concept. Um, we used to call it the manhole concept. And now that women are there, they call it the whole person concept. But the idea was we educate cadets physically, mentally, and spiritually. Because if they're going to be officers someday, they've got to have moral fiber. And morality does not exist in a vacuum. You've got to have a commander that knows how to make a decision on the battlefield, especially when men's lives are at stake, and he can stand up for the decision he made without simply saying, well, I was ordered to do it, so I did it. And that's why I think we've got to come to a new understanding of where the trial really takes us. I, I refer to a book because I think it's germane to what I want to say today. The book is called God and the Astronomers, written by Robert Jastrow. And he says, when a scientist writes about God, his colleagues assume he's either over the hill or gone bonkers. It's the same way with the shroud. You start saying you think this is Jesus, and they want to relegate you to the ash heap. But the astronomical evidence that these men found in the book led them to believe in the biblical origin of the world. Amazing. We're talking people like Einstein, Hubble, and all these men who have given us a look into space. And this is where the evidence pointed them. At the end of the book, he says, for the scientist who lives by his reason, it's like a bad dream. You climb all the way to the top of the mountain of ignorance, you reach over the top, and there are the theologians sitting there waiting on, hey, come on. <laughs> Einstein believed in God because the universe was orderly. Let me give you an example as a pilot. Flying a B-52, rules, order, technical, science. But there's an art to make the thing sit behind a KC-135 in a one-foot box. Both of them have to come together. In shroud studies, we've got to get the science, the art, and the spirituality together, and we can't be afraid of what people are going to think about us if we don't. One of their colleagues, a guy named Shapley, he was so governed by a false paradigm that with the evidence staring him in the face, he kept saying, they were wrong, they were wrong, they were wrong. Instead of looking at the facts and saying, you know what, maybe I got it wrong. I remember, I don't remember it was, if it was before the first or second time that I had the privilege of being in Al and Mary Wanger's home and seeing their work. But somewhere between meeting them and visiting them a few times, somebody came to me and said, that can't be right. All those flowers and stuff, it can't be right. But when I sat in their home and they showed me the polarization technique, I said, wait a minute, maybe there's something here that I don't understand. And that's the way we've got to think if we're going to get to the truth of the shrouding and we're going to be able to do something. One of the fields that I want to see people go into, and I've done a lot of it, and I don't have time to go into it today, but I just want to give you a taste. Hermeneutics. It's the science and art of biblical interpretation. Science because it has rules. Science because it's orderly. Art because human communication is flexible. It depends on interpretation. It depends on understanding. It depends on point of view. Let me see if I can give you an example. The Bible says they took the body of Jesus and wrapped it in linen as the manner of the Jews is to bury the dead. I can't tell you the number of times that I've had people come, well, Jesus was wrapped in linen strips like a mummy, and Jesus was wrapped in blah, 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 blah. Hogwash. Go to your local Jewish bookstore and pick up a book called The Code of Law. 
and look at what it says, and you're going to find some things in there. Just a few that I picked up that might interest you shrouders. Just a few. It's customary to make the linen, the shroud, a fine white linen to indicate our belief in the resurrection of the dead. If a person falls and dies instantly, his body is bruised or blood flows from wounds or there's an apprehension that his lifeblood is absorbed in the clothes, it needs to be scooped up and wrapped with the body. So we can say that maybe Passion of the Christ got a lot of stuff wrong, but somebody did their homework because that's exactly what's going on here. They're trying to portray a truth that a lot of people have no concept of. I remember the arguments about whether or not there were coins on the eyes and so on and so forth, whether or not there's a phylactery on the forehead. Look here again and understand this, that these codes of laws, the Torah and the Tanakh and all the things that the Jewish people live by, tradition, that we Christians have somehow forgotten and thrown to the side, there are some evidences here such as it's, the eyes are supposed to be closed, such as the way the body is laid out in death, such as the fact that an object on the body is buried with the body. Are you aware that they took Jesus when he was at prayer? Are you aware that Jews of Jesus' day and today wear phylacteries here and on the arm? So therefore, if he was murdered and mocked as both a religious leader and a political figure, those would have been covered with his lifeblood, and guess what? <clears throat> Buried in the tomb. Answers a lot of questions without a lot of hoopla of people saying, well, it can't be, or I see this, or this one doesn't see that. We've got to kind of come together and get some unity on where we're going. Let's see where I put this thing. <clears throat> okay, let's take another area. What is the meaning? What is the purpose of the shroud? A lot of people have asked me that over the years. I've come to a different understanding of what I'm, I'm thinking about. I, don't, I haven't reached the end of my journey. None of us, I think, have reached the end of our journey where shroud studies are concerned. I think we've barely scraped the surface. But let me just give you a for instance. How many of you have studied all of the references in Scripture to white linen? Or studied how white linen figures in to the resurrection of the Messiah, figures in to the feast days of the Jews. Do you remember what they were told consistently in the Old Testament? Make sure you do it according to the pattern. Or let's give a modern version of tradition. <laughs> there was a reason they were told to do this. And if you understand biblical hermeneutics, the reason was one of the first principles of biblical hermeneutics is prophetic fulfillment. When you see this happen, you can say, yes, the prophets of God told us it was going to happen that way. So we come to linen. And it's why I called this my white linen, white paper. Jesus had just completed a Passover Seder. During the Seder, there's a number of elements that you use. One of the elements is the matzah. If you've never seen matzah really up close, as a Christian, you should go get some and look at it. It's flat, leavenless bread that's pierced and striped. And most Jewish people can't tell you why it is. They'll just tell you that's the way we've always made it. Most people can't tell you why they put it in a linen bag called a unity, a white linen bag called a unity. But it actually has three pieces in it. Now, if you understand the biblical term for echad, Shema Israel, Adonai Elohenu, Adonai Echad, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. That cod is like one bunch of grapes. It's not one like one podium. You understand what I'm saying? And so when they say this, this unity, it represents these three pieces of matzah. What do they do with the middle matzah? Jesus takes the middle matzah and he breaks it. And he says, this is my body, 
broken for you. And then what does he do? He hides it away. Very interesting. It's hidden away. And the one who finds it gets a reward. But then having found it, it's supposed to be distributed to all. I've been looking for this tape ever since the dry run. It's my understanding that CBS, not CBS, uh, CBN. CBN, if they haven't destroyed it, have the, cap the copy of the tape. I haven't been able to track it down. But there was a little minister from a Pentecostal church who stood in front of all these PhDs and their wives, and he was practically shaking in his boots <coughs> after we did our dry run. And he said, I have to tell you something. He said, I don't know if you can accept it. I don't know if you can hear me. I know you guys all have PhDs and you're a lot smarter than I am and on and on and on. He said, but in prayer this week, God told me that the information that you're going to get is to be shared with the world because it's information that people would kill or die for. True statement? Absolutely true statement. And when we become afraid of what men are going to say, because, well, I'll not be considered scientific if I say I think it's Jesus. I'll not be considered a Jew if I say I think it's Jesus. Come on, we've got to wake up and realize we've been entrusted with this wonderful gift. And there are people out there, we become no better than the Centro, we all kind of complain about. They're easy to pick on, aren't they, Rex? <laughs> <laughs> They bring it on themselves. Good. I like that. <laughs> but we become no better than them if we keep the shroud to ourselves. And it becomes a little clickish thing that we have over here on the side. We do, we're no better. I, I know this much. That three-dimensional statue that you all talk about, and I was there in Colorado Springs and and I helped, and, and Dee did too, and, and some of the cadets did too. And if you go to the Catholic chapel, you'll see our pictures on the wall there with one of the three-dimensionals that we made. And I have a 3D mock-up of the face, and I've traveled all across this country to speak on this route, and I carry that thing with me. In fact, I almost brought it here, but in the hullabaloo over our new grandbaby, I forgot it. Apologize. But um, everywhere I go, people take one look at it, and they say, it's Jesus. There's never any question who it is. They take one look and they say, it's Jesus. How did you do that? Where did you get that? So why are we embarrassed or ashamed before scientific or historical or whatever kind of society to say, we think this is Jesus? Why would we be ashamed? You know, my Bible says, um, if you're ashamed of me, I'll be ashamed of you before my father. Now that may be a little bit heavy for some of you to take, but you haven't gotten to know me yet. <laughs> and maybe you will. I'd like that. Everybody I've ever met who's gotten involved in this, I love them. Barry and I are like brothers. I hadn't seen Dee or Joe in years, but it's like, we never, you know, lost communication. We went right back and started talking, remember this and remember that, and the slides that were put up. <coughs> I remember being in Ray Rogers' home, and he told me through tears, all my life has been dedicated to weaponry, weapons of mass destruction and that. He said, this is one thing that's good that I want to get right might impact mankind for the better. Little vignettes that I think it's time they need to be told. I think it's time, whether it's me or whoever it is, if it's all of us together, there's got to be a point where we're willing to stand up and say, these are the real facts. This is what happened. I took, now I'm getting ahead of myself. Again, some of the things in scripture. Angels wear white linen. Priests wear white linen. The promise of God to his people is that we're going to be wearing white linen. Revelation 19 says that the clean white linen is the righteousness of the saints. 
if I had all the rest of the day to describe to you all the things in scripture that talk about white linen, the carcass that you eat at Passover is actually from a term in the book of Esther which refers to a white linen garment. And if you study Hebrew, if you go into the Torah, if you sit down with rabbis as I have, and you say, explain this to me, they'll tell you that the carpus is like representing a door, and the Hebrew, the Jewish person is passing through that door. What door is that? It's the door of redemption. Wait a minute, what did we say? This is the cup of redemption. What did we say? All of these things that they take for granted as part of their tradition, and we Christians are totally ignorant of, might be the key to understanding the purpose of this thing. And you know what? If we misuse something, it's because we don't understand the purpose. What guy in here, maybe some ladies too, has not taken a butter knife and tried to use it as a screwdriver? <laughs> it, it, it may work, but it does terrible damage to the butter knife. And it might actually damage the screw head in the <clears throat> process. If you don't understand the purpose of a thing, you can destroy it or something else. If we don't understand the purpose of the shroud, we miss the opportunity to impact mankind in a positive way. Now, gosh, it's almost time for me to sit down. I haven't even scraped the surface of some of the things I'd like to say. Zachariah, I'm going to pour out upon the house of David and upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem, the spirit of grace. If you want to know what those numbers are, um, it's the Strong's Concordance. And if you looked at Strong's Concordance, you could get all the original words. That's a part of biblical interpretation, the science of interpretation. It's not just because some minister gets up and says, well, the Bible says this or the Bible says that. You do have, there is a science to it. There's an order to it. And unless you take and look at it, you won't understand Zachariah says they're going to look on the one whom they pierced and mourned for him. Speaking of the Jewish people, can I ask you a question? Christians, not Jews in the room, just Christians. If Jesus is coming back as we believe, he's certainly coming back to be beaten and pierced and striked again. How are they going to look if there's no picture? Why does the Apostle Paul say we're looking at an image uh, like a dim mirrored image through a glass darkly is the expression. Like a dim mirrored image. Why does Isaiah say that his face marred more than any man and his form more than the sons of man would startle and uses the Hebrew term nazah which is the blood of sprinkling, the blood of expiation, the blood that the priest sprinkled on the altar that got all over his white linen garments. Are you getting a picture? Too much coincidence is no coincidence. There's a pattern here. And I think it's a pattern that we who have studied the shroud have the best opportunity to recognize and to say something about. Again, I barely scraped the surface of what I found. I, I started looking into Bible codes, for example. And I didn't get the popular um, Bible code program off the shelf. I did eventually, but I went and got the Torah code program from a Jewish group in New Jersey. And when I put the shroud in there, I got reams of paper that I can't even interpret. I'm not a Bible code expert. I'd like to find one so I could take those reams of paper and sit down and say, tell me what this means. Because you see, if I believe the Bible, <clears throat> I heard for years that um, Dee had made a decision for the Lord. I only heard last night how it actually happened. Maybe he'll have a chance to share it. But what I can tell you is, in the carpool, before there ever was a stir, there were four professors at the academy. Myself in the English department, John Jackson in the physics department, Eric Jumper in the aeronautical department, and D. German in the electrical engineering department. And as guys will do, we talked about religion and politics. Remember this, D? And the question came up, God, if he exists, gave me this scientific mind, and he will reveal himself to me through science. And John Jackson answered, well, what about the shroud? And D. said, has it ever been scientifically studied? Do I remember pretty well? 
That's right on. <laughs> Here we are 32 years later, people, and every study that we've generated, with the exception is what, what uh, Rex said last night, the kooks and oddballs that are on the outside, everybody that has really seriously studied it comes away with more and more and more evidence that points toward authenticity. What do we do with it? Do we sit on it? Do we sweep it under the rug? Are we more concerned with what people will think about us or say about us if we say, I believe it's Jesus? Or are we going to say, I've seen that face. I know that face. That face changed my life. I'm going to close with this story where somebody else has to get up and speak soon. There's a group of nuns. Now, like Pete, I was a good altar boy going up. In fact, before puberty, I wanted to be a priest. Some of you will get that. <laughs> um, I have a dear friend in the Catholic Church that he lets me uh, preach his Bible study when he's out of town. And we have a running joke that if the Catholic Church had a married priesthood, I would probably still be a practicing Catholic. But I also tell him this. I'm not Jonah. I can't swim in the belly of a fish. When God called me, I said, okay, sir, what do you want me to do now? And I've been there. And I went and got this little cloister Carmelite nuns in Louisiana that are my prayer team. Mary and I are among the few civilians who have ever been allowed behind the walls of the cloister. And we've prayed for them and we've ministered to them. And I took that three-dimensional face in there and two blind nuns took the three D people and they put their hands around them and they said, you've given us a chance to see Jesus. Does that do for you what it does for me? That happened at least 15, 20 years ago and I still get choked up thinking about it. And then I think about the letters I've gotten from people, I, I flew with a guy named William Spears. He was a tanker pilot when I was a B-52 pilot. He happened to be the organist for his little Baptist church, and Mary was a Baptist when we got married, so it was not natural for us to visit his church. When we talked about God, I assumed he was a Christian. I just, just everything that he said, everything that he did, sweet couple, we were in their home, they were in our home. I got a letter a few years ago from Willie Spears. And he said, I was on the West Coast and I walked into a little used bookstore and I saw a book with your name on it. And he said, I wondered if it could be you and I picked the book up. He was at that time the chief pilot for, I think it's called the Paradise Corporation that owned Holiday Inn. He said, um, I picked the book up, Ken, and I couldn't put it down. I read it from cover to cover. It was my first book, Bert on the Shroud. He said, at the end, I put the book down and I gave my heart to Jesus Christ. He said, I want you to know that it's changed my life. I was stunned. A few months later, he passed on. And what if I had not written that book? What if I told you I have boxes of letters from people who've been to presentations that I've made or picked up my book somewhere and read it? and it changed their life. Not that they worship the shroud. Not that the shroud becomes an article of their faith, but rather that looking at the love of Jesus as seen through that linen, it has transformed their lives. Might I suggest that each of us, all of us, figure out for whatever time God has ordained for us to be left on this planet, because he has blessed us with the privilege of seeing and handling that love close up and personal. Can we make a joint and individual decision that we're going to use it for the betterment of mankind from this day forward? If so, I will have accomplished my white linen white paper. God bless you.